Good morning. How are you? Anybody enjoying the sunshine this morning? We're, we're two days into spring and I'm already enjoying it. Hope everybody's having a good morning. Let's all stand up. We're going to do jumping jacks this morning to get ready for the service. No, no, we're not. That's. I'm going to start out singing, Lord, I need you. They're laughing up in the balcony. I don't know what they're saying. going to have to help me out this morning. I was sick last week. I had other plans. I was actually going to sing with my old church. The choir director was retiring. It was supposed to be a celebration of his. I was going to go sing with them, and I got sick on Saturday and didn't get to sing with anybody. So y'all sing loud and help me out this morning. Hymn number 227, Praise Him, Praise Him. <coughs> Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, His wonderful love proclaim. <clears throat> hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor. <clears throat> name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children in his arms. 
carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise <clears throat> joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. <clears throat> Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded. <clears throat> praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. May be seated. It is good to see you. It's good to see your smiling face. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning. The sun is up and bright shining and it feels good outside and it's just a good day to be with you. I'm glad that you've come today. If you come today as someone's guest or maybe this is one of your first times ever being here and you've never filled out a guest card, there's a little yellow card hopefully on the pew in front of you. You might have to look above or beside you. If you put that in what we are calling the offering plate, which is actually the mailbox, we got three mailboxes on your way in or out. If, if you want to give, we're not passing the plate. But if you'll put a guest card in there, that yellow card, that's going to help us to serve you better. And we're really glad that you're here today. Let me give you... Uh, just a few announcements, one of which is that today is just such a special day because this afternoon at 2 o'clock, you go home and change clothes or have lunch or whatever you're going to do, come back here, and we're going to be celebrating a, a huge uh, uh, moment in the life of a church, which is, which is the ordination of two deacons, Jeremy Prince and Jonathan Burgess. And so we'll be back, right back here at 2 o'clock. No evening service tonight. Uh, then in three weeks from now, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper on April the 11th. And uh, those uh, two new deacons, Jeremy and Jonathan, will be joining us uh, as we do that and serving that alongside us. And also, that's in three weeks, Sunday school will be started back up. Amen? Amen. Getting back to Sunday school, getting back in small groups and learning the Word of God with each other back to what the Lord has designed us to do. Reminder that we're taking up for the month of March uh, any Armstrong offering, and we have already neared our goal on that. I don't know the total completely, but our church goal is $1,500, and I think we're pretty close to it. And uh, because some, um, some additional funds came in last week, also take note in the middle and the bottom of your bulletin that we now have over $2,500 in our adoption fund, which is there uh, to come alongside, again, adoptive Christian families that are seeking uh, to please the Lord in that. And uh, thank you so much for your sacrifice uh, to give toward that. Guys, we are going to continue to worship the Lord in truth and in spirit. I'm thankful for Facebook. And thank you for everyone that's tuning in. I was not texting while driving. I... Uh, but I was at a stop sign on my way here because we had to uh, deal with a, a delay, and I was able to worship with you guys all the way coming up South Knight Street while ago. And so uh, I sang with you from a distance, and I know many of you guys are singing with us from home, and we're glad. We're glad that you have been able to join in with us. Guys, one uh, other change, let me uh, make sure you see in our bulletin. 
is uh, we do have the Unreached People Group of the Week. We constantly aware and bringing these people to the Lord because of their limited or no access to the gospel. You have a population of 835,000 people uh, in this group in Vietnam um, that about 10,000 of them identify as Christians and uh, so very little access to the gospel, very little uh, gospel evangelical work there. We want to pray for them. But because we've prayed through all of our Vermont churches, we are actually uh, putting uh, missionaries from the North American Mission Board. We're going to pray for them and their families. So this week, we invite you to pray for Jeremy and Sarah Promse, church planners at Refuge Community Church in San Mateo, California. So we want to lift them up to the Lord as well. And one other note, if you, I think almost everyone probably got a hard copy uh, this week in the mail. If you didn't, if you're, especially if you're a church member, if you didn't, let me know. Because that means we may not have your mailing dress down. But we, we sought to get to you not only an invitation to this week's ordination, but also a prayer. Um, uh, 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 what is it? What did I put on there? Not a prayer. A prayer and study God. A prayer God in anticipation of revival. And I, I'm inviting you to do that along with me. It's a 28-day guide that starts tomorrow because revival is four weeks from today. And so tomorrow there's a, a very small portion of Scripture there's a very specific prayer on there that we invite you to pray alongside of us. And I would invite you, if you haven't, if you got that in the mail, to start that tomorrow. If you didn't, I'd love to put one of those in your hands before you leave today. Because I think that the, the, the time of revival is a work of preparation in our heart and in our lives that the Lord would meet us. I, I was just reading this morning from Leonard Ravenhill. He said, revival is when God gets tired of being misrepresented and shows up. And I thought, well, that's interesting. God gets tired of being misrepresented and just shows up himself. I want the Lord to show up himself when we meet in truth and in spirit. And that's in April, 8, April 18th through April the 21st. So join us, if you will, this week and for the next four weeks in daily prayer and seeking the Lord's face. Let's pray. Father, you're good to us. You're worthy of worship and so much more. That's why we've come today, Father to lift up your name on high. Thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for leading us, guiding us, directing us, and blessing us. Father, meet with us this morning as we open up your word, as we gather together as your church to exalt your holy name. I pray, Father, Lord, that as we come into this room, Lord, so many different individuals, backgrounds, things that are going on that nobody else around us knows, God, and yet you in your wisdom and in your sovereignty, you have the capacity to speak and direct every one of us individually, not just in this church, Father, but as your, as your name is being lifted up all over the globe. And Father, that's what we ask of you, Father, stir us. Father, some of us need stirring. Convict us, Father. Some of us are growing hard. Lead us, Father. Some of us aren't moving. And Father, Lord, open up our eyes and our hearts to see your glory and your majesty, Father. Lord, I pray if there's somebody that's lost, that they would quit running from you, that you'd bring clarity to their heart and mind, that they need to turn from their sins and put their trust in you, and that you will save them. Father, today we gather, we, we lift up this uh, people group in Vietnam, and we pray, Father, for that, those thousand of them that, that are a, a, such a small minority there. Lord, give, the, give them a backbone, give them strength, Father. Guide them and direct them. Father, help the, their voice to be loud, and Lord, let, their, let them be salt and light in their communities. I pray, Father, for this a couple, this family, and this church plant in San Mateo, Father. As they gather this morning to worship you, to continue to reach out to their community, to plant this church, to make disciples, give them fruit for their labor, God. Give the, bless their marriage, that they be unified and devoted to you, Father. Protect them, Father, not just from harm, but from evil. And Lord, we know that the devil loves to separate and divide through sin and temptation. So protect this husband and this wife as they commit themselves to your work. Lord, again, meet with us, Father, as we lift up your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together again. <coughs> Hymn number four, to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, 
and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. <clears throat> praise the Lord. <clears throat> Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of God the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, <clears throat> let the people rejoice. Oh, come, the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. <clears throat> great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <clears throat> oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. <clears throat> All right, the next song is it is well with my soul and you can thank my wife for this because she bought me a little book that lists some songs in it and then it gives little stories that go with it which is really good because I'm you know I probably should read more into the some of the songs we sing but I don't have 24 hours a day to sit and go with every song but this song was written in the late 1800s written by Horatio Spafford and the words don't necessarily you wouldn't know where they come from unless you read the background. Um, he, had a, he was a lawyer, had a business in Chicago during the Great Fire. That was ruined. So him and his wife and I believe four daughters were going to go to Europe for a trip. His wife and four daughters left before him because he got tied up doing some stuff back home. Uh, in the process of them leaving, their ship collided with another ship. All four of his daughters drowned and were killed. And his wife was one of very few survivors. So in the process, he was getting on a boat, heading to Europe to meet up with his wife. And as he was sailing over right where his daughters has died, he had a great peace come over him, and this is when he wrote this song. So when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows row, that gives new meaning to the sea billows and what he was looking at. So hymn number 410, It is well with my soul. <clears throat> when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well 
with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. <clears throat> and Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. That song's preaching fuel. That's good. Let's turn your Bibles. Acts chapter 21. If you didn't know, we were going to be there this morning. We're, we're in Acts, walking through the book of Acts. We are coming to the end of the uh, missionary journey part of the book of Acts. Uh, this is the third missionary journey. The last seven chapters of Acts are not missionary journey stuff. It's not traveling city to city, planting churches, evangelizing. It actually has a whole lot of politics in it, a lot of standing before accusers, being put on house arrest, having to defend yourself from false accusations. So the last quarter of this book takes a turn, but this morning we're still finalizing this third missionary journey. We're following Paul into a few uh, additional cities, and if you were with us last week, really the last two weeks, we have seen him give farewell speeches, first to the city at Troas, and, and he, I think everyone knew he probably wouldn't be back, but then last week uh, to the, he met with the elders of Ephesus in another city in Miletus because he knew he wouldn't be back, having spent three years with them. And this, this, this kind of dark cloud is hanging over the last two conversations. The, the dark cloud is uh, Paul feels in his spirit, though he doesn't have all of the details, he feels in his spirit that wherever he's going, he's probably not coming back. 
and uh, he's right. He doesn't know all the details. He doesn't know exactly what he's doing, exactly where he's going, but he did mention in chapter 20 that he knew that imprisonment and affliction awaited him. I don't know how much, I don't know where, I don't exactly know when, but the Lord had revealed that much to him that trouble was ahead. And one of the things I want you to see this morning, brothers and sisters, is I really think that what we read this morning in, in the Apostle Paul, in his actions and his attitudes, is something that is intended for our emulation. Because what we see Paul do and say here is emulated after Christ. And there is, the best way I can put it, there is a remarkable conviction in Paul's words here. There is an unbelievable courage that you and I as Christians, every one of us, and especially men, we want to attain to. So I encourage you this morning, if you will, to stand for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to read chapter 21, and we're going to read from verse 1 through 16. When he had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. There the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemy. We greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and he bound his own feet and his own hands and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. And after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Mason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. Let's pray. Father, help us to see in your word a living word this morning. Lord, able to divide soul from spirit, bone from marrow, And let us yield ourselves to the author of these words as we understand them, as we believe them, and as we put them into practice. We pray it in the name of Jesus and by his power. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to ask yourself a question honestly this morning. If God were to reveal to you your day of death, do you think you could handle it? Do you think you could handle it? If you knew the the day of your death, maybe you got a date written on the wall by our Lord, January 14th. But he left the year off. So year after year, you held your breath, wondering if that was the year. 
What if you had a, what if you had a heartbeat countdown? It just sat there on the wall. Well, no strenuous activity for me. I got to I got to spread these out or a breath counter. I think we were honest. Most of us will say, couldn't handle that. Couldn't handle it. And that perhaps is the reason why you and I don't know so much. That God, the all-knowing one, and also the all-wise one, grants us knowledge, only that which we can handle through his grace and by his power. I know for sure I couldn't handle it. It would keep me from living the very thing that told me when my life was over. It would fill me with fear and anxiety. Or perhaps if the day were many, many days away, it would give us and grant us some sort of licentiousness as if we're invincible and we can do anything. I mean, the clock still says I have 20 years. Let's get crazy. I don't think I could handle it. I think the Lord grants us certain amounts of knowledge, only that which we can handle, because I think the default is, Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount, in the greatest passage, really, as it pertains to human anxiety, that we are to ask him for daily bread. The anxiety that you and I often feel, it's part of life, is wanting tomorrow's bread today. We want more, and the secret things belong to the Lord. But sometimes he does grant us more. Sometimes he does grant us direction, as is the case with the Apostle Paul, who it says earlier in chapter 20, verse 20, this is last week's text, verse 20 and 23 of last week's text, if your Bible's open, he said, Behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. That is to say, God gave him some information, not all. He didn't give him a date, didn't give him a promise, didn't even give him for sure a location, but he said, I know, I feel in my spirit, by the Holy Spirit, that there's trouble in front of me. We often, I believe, have in our minds the idea that the Holy Spirit means safety. There must be safety in the Holy Spirit. But i got to tell you, brothers and sisters, he doesn't always lead us to safety. Remember that the moment after Jesus was baptized and his ministry was inaugurated, it was the Spirit who carried him off into the wilderness for 40 days of fasting and intense temptation at the hand of the devil. It was the Spirit. The Holy Spirit took him in that direction. No, the Holy Spirit does grant comfort. The Holy Spirit does grant peace. But the Holy Spirit does not always grant safety. Nor does he always lead us to safety. In fact, I'll tell you this, I believe a preoccupation with safety will certainly prevent you from total submission to the will of our Lord. A preoccupation with safety will keep you from obedience. Safety first, they say. But that's not true. You would never arrive at that conclusion with only the Scriptures that safety was first. Even in, a, even in a world where I think governments with sometimes the best of intentions are seeking safety to be first, godless governments especially have no capacity to, decide, to, to make that decision, let alone really quantify the value of life. See, it's only Christians that know the true value of life because we know what happened in the past. So Christians have a greater value of life. And yet, here's a paradox... Christians hold on to the future with a looser grasp because we know about the future. We hold on to life with a future grasp. Because we know the past, we understand life has greater value. But because we know the future, we hold on to it not quite as tightly. We know what's coming. We know it's good. And we know it's better. It's better. Safety and a preoccupation with it will prevent us. Living your life demands a certain portion of risk 
But following Christ means incurring a significantly higher amount of risk. Paul had trouble ahead. The Spirit communicated that to him personally, he com- but he didn't just communicate it to Paul personally. He communicated it through other people to Paul. Did you see the people in the text this morning that were trying to talk him out of doing what the Lord had told him to do? These are not unbelievers. These are Christians. One by one they come, beginning first in verse 4. If your Bible's open, having sought out the disciples, we stayed there entire. We stayed there for seven days, and through the Holy Spirit, through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. The tense of that verb is continually. It indicates that day after day, for seven days, the Christians entire were saying, You really shouldn't go to Jerusalem. And then later at dinner, Paul, have you thought again about where you're going at the end of the week? And the next morning at breakfast, Paul, we've been talking and we don't think you're supposed to go. And then again and again and again and again, don't go. Christian people with a heart full of love. I don't think you should incur this risk. We feel in the spirit that this is not a wise decision for you. Verse 8 and 9, it says, The next day we departed and came to Caesarea. We entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven. We stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Now, we can't really argue much here because it doesn't tell us the contents of these prophecies, except that for a few days, Paul stayed in the house of four young ladies who had the gift of prophecy who had the capacity to foretell that which was going to happen. Now, I cannot say with confidence that they also had the same advice to him. I'm just saying that it's probably not coincidental that this detail is planted in between these people who told him not to and these people who told him not to. We don't know what they said. We don't know what these ladies said for sure. Perhaps their word to him was a private one. But I think God intersected the paths of Paul and these four girls with the gift of prophecy. So once again, he would know, this is what's coming for you. The spirits told him. The people at Tyre have warned him. He's lodged now in the house of Philip, the evangelist. By the way, Philip was, if you don't remember him, he's one of the seven, one of the original seven deacons from Acts chapter 6. He was used in chapter 7 and 8 in the early part of the church in uh, in a tremendous way. Look forward again with me, verse 10 and 11. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming to us, he took Paul's belt, he bound his own feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns the belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Paul walks into the room, hey, what are you doing with my belt? Oh, this is your belt. Now, Agabus, we heard about him earlier. He was in Acts chapter 11. He predicted a famine that was coming. He was right. There were men in the early church that had this gift. A lot of times the prophets in the Old Testament, we see it with Ezekiel, we see it with Jeremiah, we see it with Hosea, we see it with Isaiah. They lived out their prophecies. They did their prophetic work through drama sometimes. Hosea, I mean, he went, he went the extra mile. The woman that he married, the message that he delivered. Isaiah took some pretty extreme measures as well we won't talk about. Agabus is acting out the prophecy, so he takes this belt. It it doesn't tell us where it is. I don't know, maybe it's hanging over on the wall, and and he ties up his own legs and arms. He says, hey, I don't know who this belt belongs to, but I got a word from the Lord. Whoever this belongs to, this is what's going to happen to you when you get to Jerusalem. So essentially, this is the fourth prophet. This is the fourth prophetic word. Bad stuff is ahead. And then verse 12, when... We heard this. Who's we? Like the the whole crew, like the, the group of godly men accompanying Paul on this journey. We certainly includes Luke. Luke's the one writing this. We, he says, we have become convinced. Paul, don't go. And it says verse 12, we urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Luke is joined by the team, the others at Caesarea. There is advice coming from all corners. This is a bad idea. Let me just say, the proverb says that there is safety with an abundance of counselors. And there is. And you should. I'm just going to tell you real quick, if four people in your church tell you this is a bad idea, you really need to pay especially close attention to it. But what we're dealing with here is not the kind of counsel that would steer you away from folly. 
this is the kind of, I truly believe, love-motivated, love-motivated advice that just doesn't want you to get hurt, don't want to see you harmed. This is not like, this is foolish, that's a foolish decision, God's made it clear in his word, we're not supposed to be doing that. You get four people in the church that tell you not to do that. You get four people that know you in your church that tell you not to marry that lady, that's what I was going to tell you. That's probably the Lord speaking. The Lord speaks through wise people who know you, who know the Lord. Listen to them. But that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a lot of people that are scared. Now, they're, they're, they're prophesying accurately, but they're interpreting it wrongly. You know, perhaps by default, we are programmed to believe that God always wants us to avoid danger. He always wants us to be safe. And even if we're willing to take that risk on for ourselves, we have a hard time permitting other people to take that risk on. Why? Because we love them. And what, what is love but a desire to protect other people? I don't want to see them get hurt. I don't want to see them harmed. The Spirit wasn't communicating a different message. The Spirit was communicating the same message to everybody. But what everyone else couldn't really figure out, what, what, what was puzzling them and troubling them is that Paul would actually march forward anyway. It, it seems to, by default that he would want to avoid it. But that's what love does. Brothers and sisters, risk is mine to take. It's mine. I can't always expect other people to support my risk. And it's a natural desire. It's a natural thing to desire safety for the people that we love. I was thinking this morning, <clears throat> you know, if everybody in the military tomorrow, everybody serving in the United States military had to have a signed permission slip from their mother, father, and spouse, a lot of people would have to go home. So they wouldn't be able to get it. If everybody serving on the front lines, if anybody, everybody serving as first responders had to get a signed permission slip from mom and from dad and from their spouse, a lot of them would not have to quit their job. Because there's people in their life that love them and, and they don't want them to take that risk because they want them safe. And again, that, that, that's natural, but risk is mine to take. And your risk is yours to take because one day you and I are going to give an account without our spouse and without our mom and dad, of what risk we took for the glory of God, the advancement of the gospel, to obey the command that he has planted in our hearts and in his word. And mom and dad won't be there, and our spouse won't be there. Risk is yours to take. Risk is mine to take. Jesus, he had Peter, if you recall, pulled him aside and rebuke him when he predicted his own death. Do you remember that story? Peter rebuking Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to die. And Peter says, I need to have a private word with you. You're not going to do that. Peter didn't get it. Paul has these people pulling him aside, rebuking him for marching to Jerusalem. Even Luke they don't get it. Pastor James Coates has been spent, I told you about him last week at prayer meeting, he spent the last month and a half in a prison cell in Canada for refusing to shut his church down. And there are Christian people, perhaps even in this room, that thinks he just needs to comply with the government, quit making trouble, just quit having worship service, quit preaching. You don't get it. You don't get it. I remember in 2011, I went on my first mission trip to Mexico with Tony Steele. Went down to Zacatecas and doing saturation work down there. And I remember some good-hearted, love-motivated people in the church. Brother Derek, I just don't think that. And during that time, CNN especially was running stuff about drug cartels in Mexico. And I had one particular person say, hey, not only do I not think you should go, you shouldn't go. you got a wife and a child at home. You shouldn't go to Mexico. Love them. You just don't get it. 2007, I had a young man. I was uh, leading a youth group, Sellersburg, Indiana. I had a young man come to me. 
I said, I feel, I feel called by God, perhaps, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with this, to preach. I feel like maybe God's called me into the ministry. I said, okay. He said, well, I went and told my dad. And my dad yelled at me, and he mocked me. He said, I'd never make anything, and I'd certainly never make any money, and that it was just foolish. His dad didn't get it. We're not talking about unbelieving people all the time, brothers and sisters. We're talking about even Christian people who just don't get it. But brothers and sisters, when the calling of God is upon a man's life and is spoken into a man's heart, there is no effective resistance in all the world. As a matter of fact, Alexander McLaren said, submission to God's will is resistance to man's hostilities. Submission to God's will is resistant to man's hostilities, even good men's. When I say calling, I don't want you to merely put this as a mysterious vocational calling. Like, well, he's called to preach or called to shepherd the flock or called to be a missionary. Guys, when I say calling, I mean even the ordinary things of your life. The decisions that you have made, the convictions you have that are first based and rooted in the word. But then beyond that, you have prayed, reasoned, and made a decision in conjunction with this word that you are to do a certain thing for the glory of God. I mean, even those kinds of callings. In my family, we have a calling for my wife to stay at home. Bible command all the wives to stay at home? No. But it's our calling. We didn't just flip a coin one day and say, oh, this is where it landed. And some people, they do make decisions like that. There's, there needs to be some, some thinking, some rationale, some prayer about this, some searching the word. You know, what does God actually have an idea about this? But you know, we, 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 we sought the scriptures. We felt convicted in our heart. And this is just what we wanted to do as long as we could do it. We have a conviction, a calling from God to educate our children in a certain way. These are decisions, again, we didn't just arrive at haphazardly, but in obedience to the revealed will of God. And for just those two examples alone, we have taken heat from Christians on both of them. How do you, without sounding, you know, snarky and arrogant, how do you say, I don't care? When people pull you aside, you're doing the wrong thing. You shouldn't do that. I love you. I don't care. I feel a conviction by God. And if the Lord takes a calling and a conviction off my heart and I feel like I can stand before him making another decision, I'll do that. When God puts a command in a man's heart to do something, then even the counsel of good intended people are not going to dissuade him. Guys, I think there's little doubt that the reason Luke records this, by the way, when you first read this, you might just think like you're reading a travel log, right? Okay, they went to this city, they hung out with these people, they went to this city, they stayed this many days, they went to that city, they sailed on that boat. Okay, what's the point here? It's little doubt that Luke, in all of the details he could have recorded, decided to put this story in here, except that he was demonstrating to us that Paul is the exemplar here, even when Luke is willing to admit in his own book that he was giving bad advice. Luke is the example of a man of courage and conviction who is persuaded that he must go on and do what God has put on his heart. A few points I want to make this morning in, in terms of practical points. Number one is to follow Christ's example. Now, if your Bible's open, and you can, I don't know if we're going to have it on the screen, Isaiah chapter 50, do we have that? If we don't, if you'll, if you'll turn your Bible, this is such a precious passage of Scripture, I think you need to read it. Oh, here it is. Isaiah 50, 5 through 7. Let's read that together. It says, The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backwards. I gave my back to those who strike, my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Now, maybe that's the first time you've read that passage. From the prophet Isaiah, some 700 years before 
Christ came as a baby in a manger. But even at first glance, if this is your first time dealing with it, you probably have figured out pretty quickly, that sounds a whole lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Some of the details that are in there, and it is. It's a prophetic word through the mouth of Isaiah, through the pen of Isaiah, about Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus is the one who fulfilled this. Jesus is the one who refused to rebel against the plan of his Father. I have opened my ear, Jesus says. I was not rebellious. The Lord demanded of me a certain certain path, and I took it. I would not turn my ear away from him. It is he who offered his back to be struck. It was he who offered his cheeks so that his beard could be pulled out. It was he who refused to turn backward. It was he who refused to hide his face from the disgrace and the spitting. And it was he, verse 7, who set his face like a flint. He set his face like a flint. What does that mean? What does that mean, like a flint? Well, it means like a hard rock. It indicates a firmness, a resolve, a commitment. How many of you know somebody or are married to somebody that is hard-headed? Raise your hand. Know somebody, you're married to somebody that's hard-headed. Anybody? Be careful criticizing them. It's one of their best traits if they'll use it for the glory of God. It's one of their best traits. Now, I want you to turn, if you're you're by family, you're by your husband, your wife, I want you to turn and just look at them and say, I'm sorry. Would you do that for me? Look, look at the person beside you. If you're sitting by somebody, say, I'm sorry. If you get a chance, look at them again. Say it, say it a little louder. Say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, some of you, I just wanted to make sure you knew how to say that. None of your spouses paid me very much to make sure you did that. The reason I say that, we're not talking about apologies and forgiveness this morning, but hard-headedness sometimes fails in that it has a hard time saying those two words. Now, if your hard-headedness is used in such a way that you refuse to admit when you're wrong, you can't, then sometimes you can crumble a relationship with that hard-headedness. Certainly, it can be used for bad means, but hard-headedness can be used also for the glory of God. Do you realize when it says that Jesus set his face like a flint, it essentially means that he was hard-headed. Like a flint, his eyes were fixed ahead on the task that was in front of him. Let me say, if you fast forward with me to the, to the gospel of Luke, and I say Luke because Luke is the author of Acts, Luke chapter 9. If you want to flip, this will be the last time I tell you to flip, except going back to Acts uh, uh, 21. Fast forward with me now to Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9, it, it, sh- it begins to show us how Jesus fulfilled that Isaiah passage, that Isaiah prophecy about setting his face like a flint. Uh, Luke 9, 30 says, Behold, two men were walking with him, Moses, talking with him, excuse me, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. If you're not familiar with this, this is the Mount of Transfiguration. One of the details I think we sometimes miss here is that part of the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus met with Elijah, the prophet, and Moses, the law, the law and the prophets, is that they were telling him about his departure, his accomplishment at Jerusalem, his death. They were telling him. This was the conversation they're having on the mountain. Fast forward with me a little bit in the book, Luke 9, 44. He's talking to his disciples. Let this word, these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. And then Luke 9, 51, a little further. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. When Luke was writing that, I think he had Isaiah 50 in mind. Jesus fulfilled this. He set his face. And the Bible says in the rest of the gospel that all he did was march toward Jerusalem. Jerusalem and there were people in his circle like Peter who said don't you know what's in Jerusalem the bad guys the Roman crucifixion threats harm death you don't want to go to Jerusalem what are you doing what are you thinking and then at the end of Luke chapter 9, 57 through 62, three random men come up to him and say, hey, we want to join the crowd. We, we want to be your disciples. And none of the three men 
seem to understand what they're getting into. None of the three men in Luke 9, 57 through 62, three men, hey, I want to come, I want to follow you wherever you go. Don't you understand that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head? Hey, I want to come and follow you. Let me just go bury my father first. Hey, let the dead bury their own dead. As for you, come and follow me. These guys don't understand. They don't get it. Guys, for all the talk I'm telling you this morning about people that don't get it, can I, be, I don't get it sometimes either. These guys don't get it. Signing up for Jesus is a death march. Not just for them, but for you and me. Take up your cross and follow me. March with me to Jerusalem. Are you willing to give it all up? To follow me? To yield yourself to me? That song, I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I love that song. I am resolved. I am tired of playing around with the pretty little trinkets of this world. I am resolved. Set my face like flint. I am resolved to follow my Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith. Do what he will, willeth. He is the heavenly or the living way. God, give us men who are resolved. Grant us men that are hard-headed, faces like flint, consumed, fixated on following the call of God in their lives so that no man can dissuade them. I am convinced that most churches today, they are not suffering from a great deficiency of Bible knowledge. What we are suffering from today is a deficiency of courage to do the things that we already know we are to be doing. Let God raise up men of resolve, courage. As we inch closer to Resurrection Sunday, three weeks, we have to remember that the fear of death is the trump card of the adversary. That is, when he plays it, if it will not shake you, if it will not phase you, that's his best card. Nothing can phase you. The devil is disarmed when you and I are not afraid to die. What can they do to me now? Those are the kind of men and women that the Lord wants in his army. Those hard-headed people, sometimes they may be hard to live with. But those are the people I want on the front lines of the battle. Both the battle I mean that is ahead for probably all of us, but also the spiritual battle with the evil one. Guys, much of what men call folly, the Lord calls courage. Follow Christ's example. Take a risk for the gospel. If you're lost, understand that coming to Christ and salvation is total surrender to his lordship. Walking away from sin and committing yourself into his hand. The first thing I want you to know this morning, follow Christ's example. The second thing, hear me out this morning, beware of standing in the way. Beware of standing in the way. Verse 13 says, Paul answered. He finally answered. Luke is pleading. The people at Caesarea are pleading. The people back in Tyre were pleading. Everybody's pleading. Don't go to Jerusalem. And he finally says in verse 13, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. Do you not understand? I'm not only ready to be in prison but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, this is the most gracious way Paul could say, back off, back off. You're not going to talk me out of this. I have a calling from God in my life. He has compelled me in the Spirit. I know what I must do. So please, stop it. Stop trying to beg me not to do what I know God's called me to do. This, again, this is not 
promoting or persuading, excuse me, somebody to come to Christ in tears. We should do that. It's not persuading somebody to, to take a wise decision, not a foolish one. We should do that. It's not informing a brother about something they didn't previously know. We should do that. This is persuading someone to safety. And these men are on the precipice in all of their good intentions of becoming stumbling blocks. They're close. They're getting really close to being a stumbling block. For the sake of the gospel. What did Jesus say to Peter when Peter rebuked him for suggesting he was going to die in Jerusalem? What did, what did Jesus say to him in Matthew 16, 23? What did he say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Adversary. You're a bad guy right now. I know your heart's big, Peter. I know you love me. You just don't want to see me hurt. But your desire for my safety has gone too far. And you are now in league with the evil one. If you elevate safety above obedience, if you have sought to dissuade men from obeying the Lord, the one who binds their conscience, if you would rather men follow your will than God's will, you are at risk for working alongside Satan himself. And the third word I want to give you this morning, number three, is to have faith. You say, well, that, that seems pretty simple, but hang with me for a second. Let me explain how. That faith is going to kill the anxiety that demands tomorrow's grace. It's going to kill it. When we surrender, faith is a surrender into the will of God. It destroys the anxiety. Verse 14 and 15 says, And since he would not be persuaded... Luke says, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Boy, familiar words, but heavy. The will of the Lord be done. Luke made a decision along with the other Christians that day. I will not stand in the way of what is clearly and evidently the will of God. And not only will I step out of the way, that's one thing. The will of the Lord be done. Oh man, what, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Not my will, but your will be done. What did, what did Jesus tell us to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my will. You know my will is always going to be safety and flowers and beauty and laughing. That's always going to be my will. It's probably always going to be your will, right? Everything is perfect. That's my will. But I surrender. You've got a better plan. You've got a bigger idea. You see more than I can see, and so I Turn it over to you. But it's one thing that Luke demonstrates here, uh, a surrender to the will of God. But look at what it says in verse 15. I love this. And it, he didn't just step out of the way. He stepped into the boat. He didn't have to go. He could have said, okay, it's fine. You're going to go. You're going to go. But I'm standing right here. It says in verse 15, we got ready and we went up to Jerusalem. So how can I have a faith like that? How can I have a faith like that? Well, <clears throat> I think the answer to that is back in chapter 20. Your Bible's open. Go back with me again. We, we looked at this briefly last week, but it's in verse 24. In verse 24, he says this. I think this is the key. This is where his faith comes from. is his attitude and his disposition toward life and eternity. Verse 24 of chapter 20 says, I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. Brothers and sisters, I, I think one of the reasons why we don't want to rock the boat is because we love the boat. We love the boat too much. Especially we Americans. The boat's really good. And the boat's really nice. Just, just give me the status quo. Just give me the same old predictable life that I've had. The shelter and the clothing and the electricity always comes on. The water always comes out of the fountain. Just, just give me that. Where I don't have to worry and I don't have to stress. This, this verse is not depression. 
this verse is not poverty. It's not wrong thinking. It's perspective. It's the same perspective that Paul had when he communicated to the church at Philippi. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better. For that is better. That's the perspective that grants you faith to march forward with the will of God. But here's the, big, here's the kicker, isn't it, right? Do you actually believe that? Do you believe that that is better? There There is a lot about heaven and there is a lot about eternity that the Bible doesn't tell us. There is not nearly as much in the Bible about heaven and eternity as what I would like for there to be about heaven and eternity. But the one thing we know, one thing we know for sure is that whatever it is, wherever it is, whenever it comes, it is better. But are you persuaded? Are you persuaded? This is faith. Are you persuaded that heaven is better? That to be with Christ is far better. Are you persuaded that to be with Christ is far better than your next birthday? Are you persuaded that to be with Christ is far better than your son's graduation? Are are you persuaded that to be with Christ is, is far better than being with your best friend? If we're honest, some of us live very good lives. And it's causing us to clench our fists around the life in such a way that God never intended us to do. When you read Paul saying for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, when you read him say in verse 24, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. You do not see a man with, with fists that are clenched around his life. They're loosely holding it. I love this life. It's a great life. But Jesus is better. And I may lose it. But that's okay because Jesus is better. And I may not lose it, which is great because I got to serve the Lord and do what God's called me to do. But the formula for faith and faithful living is a loose grip on our current life. The reason why we fear so much is because we have so much. By the way, that formula for faithful living today is the same formula for faithful living tomorrow. And let me just say this briefly. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 and 11 says this, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. And they conquered him. How did they do it? By the blood of the lamb and their testimony. And they did not love their lives even under death. How do you conquer the beast? How do you conquer the dragon? Love not your life even unto death. If Satan can't hang death over you as leverage, you win. Christ wins. Christ is glorified. A willingness to follow Jesus unto death is not just a prerequisite for apostles like Paul, but it's a prerequisite for every one of us. Church, every one of us. God has said, come. He has bid us come and die. Come and die. Take up your cross and follow me. Wherever he leads, I'll go. That is the mantra of every child of God. The way to defeat Satan, he does not have death to hang over you in fear. He has nothing. Brothers and sisters, we need the courage and the conviction to not just know what is right. Well, how do we know what's right? From his word. There's no doubt about this. And and from his spirit. What are we going to do in light of this world and in light of this word? You know, I think most Christians, you know what you must do, what you need do. But sometimes we let the love of the world talk us out of faithful obedience. Christian, God wants you to be fearless. And it's possible. It's possible. To loosen our grip on this world. And to obey him, even if it means setting our face like flint toward Jerusalem. We follow Christ's example. 
Why did Jesus have such radical abandonment for his life? Because he had been commissioned by his father and he had a love for you and me. He marched to his death, not on accident, on purpose. And it was worth it. It was worth it. We follow his example. We stay out of the way, brothers and sisters. Stay out of the way, who those, especially of those who are taking greater risks than you. Emulate them. Don't stop them. Surrender to the Lord this morning in faith. What about you this morning? Is there something you know you need to be doing, but you've been too fearful to do it? Perhaps even Christians have tried to talk you out of it. Is there something you know you need to be about? But you haven't done it just yet. Brothers and sisters, I think once we open ourselves up fully, if we pray in a prayer of commitment, I'm going to ask you in just a moment, when we bow our heads and close your eyes, you give a prayer of commitment. You tell the Lord, wherever you lead, I'll go. Whatever you call me to, I'll do. Be careful when you say it. They're heavy words, but I want you to say it. My life is but a vapor and it belongs to you. You stretch it out for 50 more years to God be the glory. If I've only got a few hours left, let me spend them and let my my candle go out burning hot for Jesus. Life is his. Death is better. Jesus is king. Let's follow him without fear. Father, you're good to us. Better than we deserve. I thank you, Father, for Paul's example. His willingness, the call, the conviction on his life that other people around him did not understand. And Father, Lord, as we follow and surrender our lives to you, you're going to lead us in ways that some of our own brothers and sisters will not even understand. But I pray, Father, that undergirding every decision we make would be a fearlessness, God, a commitment to you in faith, Lord. A, 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 Lord, let us be convinced and persuaded that Jesus and being with him face to face is better than the best that you have for us here on this earth. And I pray, Father, you'd raise up more men, leaders, men and women of conviction and resolve that will do what they know you've called them to do, whatever the opposition. And Father, as opposition grows, and I think it will, Lord, grant us leaders like Paul, like Jesus, Lord, there may be a way that you're specifically calling on someone this morning. I do not know. Maybe, Lord, you may be calling on someone to make a change in their life that is relatively minute and small, but yet they have not had the courage to go through with it. Lord, let today be the day. Grant them the faith they need to abandon all, to do what they know they should. Lord, there may be somebody that needs to turn from their sins today, Father. I pray you'd just finger around in their heart, convict them and break them and bring them to a place of humility. They can cry out to you in surrender. Father, there may be somebody here today that knows that, Lord, they have a huge calling on their life. You've called them to do something enormous, Father. Lord, give them courage and faith to step forward and to step out. And Father, I pray, Lord, as a church, that as we see people taking risks for the sake of the gospel, Father, that we would not be naysayers. Lord, help us to throw, Father. Help us to throw, Father, not water on fire, but fuel as encouragers to those who want to make a difference for the kingdom. Father, lead us, guide us, direct us as a church and individually, even now as we pray a prayer of commitment to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Hymn number 307, Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to
you love the Lord, say amen. <coughs> it's been good to be in God's house. <clears throat> if you got some good practice earlier with that I'm sorry stuff, you want to try to get in the car later. It might be a, a family activity on the way home. It couldn't hurt. I'm confident of that. Uh, I'm, I am thankful for this day, and I'm really thankful for what we're going to do here in about two, two and a half hours, meet back here at two o'clock, encourage you, uh, whatever you need to do, get, get dressed or, or change clothes or have a bite to eat, and it's going to be a special time. Uh, Brother Charlie's going to be bringing our charge uh, to our two deacons. There's going to be a time at the end, especially for those that have come that are ordained, to lay your hands on these two men, to pray with them privately, to give them a private words of encouragement or whatever they need. We're going to have a reception to follow back in the fellowship hall that's been set up by some of our wonderful, uh, hospitable ladies. And so I just hope that you're able to be with us again. Uh, one last random word. Uh, we do have a sign-up out here if you can do nursery on Sunday morning or during Sunday school as we get that back started. Hopefully we're going to get that back on April 11th when Sunday school starts. So if you could do either of those during the month, we'd love for you to sign up over here in the, in the hallway on the bulletin board. All right, Jonathan, sing us out of here. All right. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.